Is it going? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, hi. I'm Thomas in history at UCSB, and I use he, him pronouns. And I'm Eugene in global studies at UCSB. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and this week we're doing week four of the strike syllabus, and the subject is disaster capitalism and neoliberalism. And you. <laughs> um, and you. So we're thinking about this subject because we're in a time of global crisis and throughout history, crises and disasters have been the source of massive social change. Oh, fuck me. Groundbreaking, uh, I know. It's like not that surprising to think about the crises and disasters as being kind of big moments in history. We all know this. But what is maybe somewhat more surprising or we think about less often is the fact that intellectuals, economists, and social theorists, or just in general people who want to have a say in how society should work, um, have long tried to understand and manipulate the relationship between crisis and change. So I'll start by thinking about some old tiny historical examples of this. Um, first being David Hume, an 18th century Scottish Enlightenment philosopher. He wrote about a lot of things, but he had some sort of scattered writings about the economy and the market that were really influential in later economists. Um, but Hume believed in the inherent stability of the markets and in the market's ability to survive short-term economic shocks. Uh, subsequent economists adopted this view of Hume and they sort of evolved it to mean that government intervention compounds problems caused by a shock. And this idea that markets will discover their own natural equilibrium without interference. So in this kind of mini example, Hume thinks that markets can self-regulate and survive shocks without any kind of government intervention. Uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in the Communist Manifesto in, in the century after Hume had a different set of ideas about how crisis and economic forces interacted. And they wrote, how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of old ones by paving the way for more extensive and more dangerous crises and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. So we have two different kind of takes or views on crisis and economy that we're gonna see play out in different sort of thinkers as we talk through this. But first, uh, Eugene's gonna tell us a little bit about the sort of current economic political waters that we're existing in. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, I think David Hume and later thinkers like um, uh, Adam Smith, <laughs> are uh, <laughs> examples of liberal thinkers and liberalism and something that we talk about coming from the Enlightenment and is a very huge um, precursor of a lot of our international institutions and how we think about the world and what is good in it. Um, and we can really think about liberalism as being four main principles, individualism, egalitarianism, universalism, and meliorism, or belief in human progress. And thinking about these four things is actually a very acritical liberal self-description, right? Like while these things are what liberalism says it is, um, it's really being a historical, not thinking about what liberalism has actually done in the world. And from Man and Wainwright in their book, Climate Leviathan, say erasing liberal colonialism, slavery, racism, and gender oppression Liberalism instead tells a fable of the emergence in the thought of a privileged cadre of European Neuro-American white men of a set of principles that become realized in the practice of the modern capitalist state and its bourgeois civil society. It portrays liberalism as a product of its own idea, the universal dream of freedom realized in freedom itself. So when thinking about liberalism, freedom comes up a lot. I mean, that's what's happening in the world now. And we get to, in the late 70s and early 80s, neoliberalism, um, which emerges and shapes a lot of the world as we understand it today. So while the term's origins are older, and Thomas will actually be talking about some of the, those uh, specifics, broad-based acceptance of neoliberalism occurred in the 70s and 80s. It really equates to market fundamentalist ideas about deregulation, reduced taxation, cutting government spending on social programs, and essentially restoring the power of an economic elite. Part of this is that these market logics extend to all aspects of life. So rather than it just being an economic program, uh, it starts to, have, um, to invade essentially our social fabric, um, our political fabric, the way that we think about the world 
gets wrapped up in these neoliberalist logics. And the two people who are the biggest like proponents of neoliberalism were Margaret, Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in the United States. They're kind of like mommy and daddy of neoliberalism. Yeah, but they're not, they're not nice mommy and daddy, they're mean. Uh, the other part of neoliberals, uh, of neoliberalist global uh, infrastructure is these three institutions um, that are considered part of the Washington Consensus. So we have the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization or the WTO. And what they do throughout the world is they, that countries need loans, they're having economic problems, they're having, they're wanting to develop further, especially the global south. And um, these three different institutions come through, do a lot of things. And really what we see is that they have a lot of strict conditions with these loans and these, these guarantors of these projects, and also get us into questions of sovereignty about what these, are act these institutions are actually doing through the world. Um, and the result of them in the, the recent his uh, history and in the current moment is job losses, rising f food and fuel prices after the elimination of government subsidies, the surrender of national sovereignty to policymakers and companies from abroad. So a lot of what happens with neoliberalism is that these countries get opened up to foreign direct investment that actually undercuts a lot of what's happening in the country. So what we see from here are some problems. And the um, sort of oh. history of neoliberalism, oh, sorry, did I cut you off? You're fine, go ahead. There's something else to say. Um, history of neoliberalism and it's spread throughout the globe is very much tied to moments of crisis and disaster. Oh my God, I did the wrong slide. What are some of those problems, you You're okay. Um, so some of the problems that we see from neoliberalism and what um, what they advance really are unregulated markets. And what unregulated markets give us is really that the wealthy and the powerful consolidate more wealth and power and shape the system to favor them even more. And how we can see this in, uh, in real time is that like cost benefit analysis becomes the like analysis du jour, everyone's using them, but they don't really capture everything that you might understand about the world. Markets themselves may not provide everything efficiently in the search for greater profits. We can think about um, the insulin market, how in the search for profits and being the only people providing insulin can, ja can jack up these prices sky high so that people are active, actually dying in the world because they can't afford these prices because it's all profit driven. Companies don't wind up paying for pollution that they cause. They offset it in other ways or they just transport pollution to somewhere else that is, de is more deregulated than wherever they are. The legal system gets won over by those with more money who have access to better lawyers, can spend more time in legal battles um, so that other people have to drop out. And then those people that try to play by the rules end up as the most disadvantaged in the world. So from above, we have these pressures of greater profits, lower taxes, at the expense of workers' wages and public services. From below, you have criminals, scammers, people taking advantage of the system, um, which end up being those economically disadvantaged. And so from here, I think we can look at some, some like specific moments and get into this disaster capitalism that we kind of started with and how neoliberalism really shapes these moments. Yeah, and thinking about the relationship between neoliberalism and crisis um, throughout history. Uh, think about that. We're going to talk about Milton Friedman, who passed away in 2006. Um, he was an economist, famous for his work at the Chicago School of Economics. Uh, he was a free market capitalist, and he based a lot of his economic theories on the work of Hume, who we discussed earlier. And in the kind of vein of uh, thinking about markets as, markets as self-regulating and having a national equilibrium, he saw government regulations as obstacles to pure free market capitalism and thought of them as bad things. He thought that the only way to return to the principles of pure capitalism was through bitter medicine um, that could be administered through strategically administered shocks to the market. And he had his own take on the specific relationship between crisis and change, which gets quoted so much, and uh, well, that's fine, we'll quote it again. And he said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes a politically inevitable. 
And so on that note, the ideas that were laying around for Friedman and his students at the Chicago School of Economics centered around free market capitalism and unregulated markets. Uh, Friedman and the Chicago School implemented these ideas in a series of US interventions in South America. Before we talk about the actual interventions, this was like some very brief, like minor context. The Ford Foundation helped establish a kind of exchange program between Chile and the US, where they trained Chilean economic grad students at the Chicago School so they could be sent back to Chile to kind of spread these views. So they were showing this project in the 60s, of disseminating this knowledge, but it was politically, basically, as this kind of earlier quote said, the views that the Chicago boys were learning under Milton were kind of politically impossible in Chile because the spectrum, every political party was so far to the left of these thinkers that there was no space for their um, policies to take hold. And at least not until um, the US-backed assassination of the democratically elected Chilean President Allende in 1973, um, the CIA and some US corporate interests were very interested in getting Allende out of power they didn't like his politics or what they meant for their own ability to profit. And um, by installing Pinochet, uh, they were able to also implement a Chicago style free market policies, which they had, um, they put a giant book together before the coup that they gave to Pinochet, which he read and took notes on, was very enthusiastic about. So this is the big, the, the, these two things went hand in hand. Um, similarly, US backed coups, governments and economic programs were established in Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina. And none of these were exactly like sparkling successes for free market capitalism, but we don't need to talk about all that. The point was that these engineered political crises proved to be useful models for neoliberals who were looking to profit from disasters later on in history. And so there's a big lot about this written, and a lot of it is written by my queen, my idol, my hero, who I talk about nonstop, Naomi Klein, um, who sort of coined the term disaster capitalism to talk about um, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Naomi Klein is a journalist and an activist. She's an author of Shock Doctrine and many more books, including The Battle for Paradise, which is more recent and talks about a specific case study of disaster capitalism after Hurricane Maria. And she calls Friedman's mode of implementing change amidst crisis as disaster capitalism. To get a little bit more context, she defines them she defines disaster capitalism a couple ways. Um, in Shock Doctrine, she describes it as the orchestrated raids on the public sphere in the wake of catastrophic events, combined with the treatment of disasters as exciting market opportunities. More recently in 2020, when she was talking about coronavirus capitalism, she described disaster capitalism as describing the way private industries spring up to directly profit from large scale crises. So I'm going to look at a couple of examples in the U.S. that were very much informed by Friedman's work in the, um, South America in the 70s. So the first is going to be Hurricane Katrina, which impacted New Orleans in 2005. Milton Friedman was still alive and kicking after Hurricane Katrina, and he wrote at the time in the Wall Street Journal that the New Orleans schools are in ruins, as are the homes of the children who have attended them. This is a tragedy. It is also an opportunity to radically reform the educational system. And so this is an example of an idea that had been laying around, the privatization of schools, private schools, school vouchers, that existed before Hurricane Maria, but it took this kind of crisis to provide the cover under which to implement it. Because after writing that, the Conservative Heritage Foundation, which has many sort of Friedmanites um, on its board, called for private school vouchers in New Orleans 14 days after Katrina, so not even a month after Katrina hit, they were calling for private school vouchers, and, and President Bush endorsed that call within a week. And New Orleans is now one of the most private school heavy um, school systems in the country. A number, of a number of American contractors who had been employed by the government in Iraq were also hired by the government to take over services in post Katrina New Orleans. Um, these contractors included Halliburton, Blackwater, Parsons, and more. Um, and because of this was all under the cover of crisis, the contracts that, was, that were distributed to these um, companies totaled more than $3.4 billion, and the government didn't take competing bids. They just offered these contract, contractors. Also worth noting, Mike Pence was very involved in one of the boards that oversaw the reconstruction of Katrina. So there's just a lot of kind of long sort of tentacles to our present day. And just it could demonstrate some of the ways in which private interests have a lot to gain and do gain in terms of crisis. Another example um, that Klein talks about um, length that was sort of more in the immediate aftermath was during Hurricane, after Hurricane Maria, which hit Puerto Rico in 2017. Um, a little bit of a different situation there and there's more to it than this, but I just wanna focus specifically on the role that sort of utilities and environmental factors played in the debates about privatization in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. 
So before the hurricane, the means through which utilities were delivered kind of ended up impacting the island in a very specific way. So before the hurricane, 98% of the island's power came from imported fossil fuels, which arrived to ports, was then transplanted to power plants in the island via truck over overline routes, and then the electricity was transmitted from there through above ground wires and an underwater cable. Um, and because of this sort of protracted system of importing and delivering fossil fuel energy, energy prices for people in Puerto Rico were nearly twice the, the US average. And, it, and after a math of Maria, virtually every part of this delivery system was damaged. So ports, roads, the overline um, power lines were all damaged and delivery of electricity was almost impossible on the island for a while. And this very much shaped debates about Puerto Rico's energy systems in the aftermath of Maria. There were some sort of locally small grid renewable energy solar panel um, centers like Casa Pueblo, which who had power after in the immediate aftermath of the uh, hurricane. And this was used as an example for people advocating for small grid renewable energy grids that in the face of this kind of disaster would could not be totally knocked out by one sort of blow in the way that the system previously in place was. So this is like an activist move, an activist led thing by the former governor, Ricardo Rossello, who was governor in the immediate aftermath, was advocating for selling off the publicly owned infrastructure to private parties to encourage competition. I didn't finish that on the slide, so apologies. But um, rather than reimagining the way in which power was distributed and creating a more sustainable form of electricity, he thought the power of the problem was not enough market competition to provide the best sort of electricity. We're currently experiencing a moment of disaster capitalism in the United States um, under the threat of COVID-19. Political and corporate elites are currently trying to manipulate the crisis to their advantage, which we've seen in a number of ways, but we're also talk about some of the most visible. One of them being the government stimulus, which produced instant trillions in bailout money for corporations and has been much less quick in assisting the people, people most in need and even small businesses. Um, also, interestingly, the stimulus package had specific environmental requirements on it that could be waived if they, it was deemed necessary. And Steve Mnuchin is in charge of making this decision, who oversaw the foreclosure of like thousands of people after the Pilsenia financial crisis. So we just have a lot of long-standing ties to crises and profit. Um, Drag him, Thomas. Drag him. Uh, no, not Steve Mnuchin. Not my king, Steve Mnuchin. Um, the EPA also suspended regulations on emissions three days after a request from the American Petroleum Institute that they do so. So we see government bodies reacting in, uh, directly to the want of corporate elites. And we see that even more immediately on a state level in states like South Dakota, Kentucky, and West Virginia, where in the aftermath, or amidst what's happening with COVID, they've criminalized protests against fossil fuels in the name of protecting essential service. They could obstruct the delivery of an essential service so there cannot be gatherings or protests at these um, fossil fuel plants. In addition to the sort of corporate profit kind of opportunism, there's also been a right wing opportunism amidst of COVID just in terms of social policies. Um, some states have banned abortions as non-essential services. So Texas, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Alaska have all already passed these kinds of bans and more are in the process of being put into effect in other states. They're being challenged, but not all successfully um, without even using sort of COVID as a pretense, but still taking advantage of the moment we're in. Idaho's governor recently signed two anti-trans bills into law into the pandemic. So crisis provides a time which a lot of people are rushing to push through things that they might not have been able to do before. And I think it's important to remember in talking about the moment that we're in, that these are not, this isn't magic. We didn't just get here spontaneously. This is actually a result of choices and priorities that coalesce into this moral and political crisis. And we like to frame it as a medical crisis, right? COVID itself is a disease, a virus that has human vectors, but it's actually a problem of, of politics that how, who is getting money, who is getting assistance, are all choices that have been laid out and, and thunk through by the powerful elites and the politicians of our countries. So for example, from the 2008 financial crisis, which we'll get into in a bit, um, 50,000 positions have been eliminated from public health departments. A choice of power of where to put money and funding. Um, this moment that we're in, we really see it as the merging of austerity politics, 
of the financialization of the economy, of a concentration of power in the hands of a few, where defunding and indifference towards common goods like healthcare, like education, like any social welfare nets, and a discussion of the virus that gets wrapped up in the language of militarization, when you can see it's like a war, a battle um, against the virus, things like that, and also in social and racial cleansing. Not only are, is the virus like racialized in, um, in Asian and, Chi and the Chinese disease, and we see an increase in hate crimes against um, people of Asian descent through worldwide, really. It's also wrapped up in this idea that people should actually die, should actually choose to not live anymore so that the economy can progress. And thinking about this like capitalist urge for profits above all else. And we can really see this happening in the moment right now. So what we see here, um, next slide, yep. is a, it is a crisis of collective action. And so when thinking about disaster capitalism and like the environment and what, and that COVID-19 is a global issue, these global crises become impossible for countries and states to manage because although they have been resorting to things like nationalism, especially these xenophobic nationalism, reasserting territorial sovereignty, so like shoring up their borders, canceling international travel, things like that, political issues that are addressed are outside of any specific country's grasp. These global problems cannot be solved by individuals and individual states. Globalization and thus global capitalism create problems that are unsolvable in our nation state configuration. So our international system of sovereign states, of sovereign territories have issues that are beyond them. And while we have things like the G6, the G20, the United Nations, all of these different institutions that are supposed to be run by good faith um, are often in impediments to solutions because of this idea of national sovereignty. Um, and I think this is just, this isn't a call for like the, the like to dissolve nation states or anything like that, but just to, to think through these, these issues at a global scale that are really outside the capacity for any individual country to, um, to solve them. So let's head back to the 2008 financial crisis because I think a lot of parallels are being made between that crisis and now. And I think dwelling on it for a moment is important for, the, for where we're at and where we're going to be going. So remember that the 2008 financial crisis sent mostly global North countries into a recession and that it started as a financial crisis that transformed into an economic crisis. And the way that that happened is because our global economy has really become financialized. And especially in the United States, we have a financial based uh, economy, right? We're not producing a lot of things. Um, it's financial services is really where our money, our like the imaginary money that we have now is happening. So in the US right after 2008 financial crisis, 30 million individuals lost their jobs. There were long-term unemployment that doubled, the rates of, of unemployment doubled. Household net worth dropped 18%, which equated to $10 trillion. Um, and that the, the crisis specifically affected those who were less educated and African Americans here in the United States. And um, we can think of it kind of as it rippled out and had effects worldwide. Um, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development uh, had a report titled The Global Economic Crisis and kind of lists some things that what the uh, 2008 financial crisis should have showed us and what we should have learned from it. And personally, I don't think we learned anything at <laughs> all. But what they list are that market fundamentalist laissez-faire economic policy failed in a real world test. Having unregulated markets, when there was this big crisis, um, like went to shit. Nothing worked because the market was regulating itself and had nothing, no, um, no regulation from governments or go uh, global bodies. That there was this blind faith in the efficiency of this market, created the illusion of risk-free profits, that the growing role of financial conglomerates on commodities and derivatives, who knows what those are, led to extreme uh, vol volatility and emergence of a speculative economy, and which created bubbles like the housing bubble or the dot com bubble that happened uh, 10 years prior to that. And their recommendations were that the government, that we should re regulate the global financial system with governments working together, 
that the government and the private sector should work together to stimulate economic growth, and that developing countries should no longer be subjected to this neoliberal logic that called, caused the crisis in the first place. Um, and if we can reflect on 12 years ago, we still have this financial global economy. We still don't see governments and private sectors working well together. And if we want to zoom back into the, into the UC, obviously this is affecting us. We are part of Strike University that is thinking about the UC and how it is in crisis. Um, and if we look at um, after what happened after the 2008 recession, we see that across the United States and in, in California, state support declines with decreases in tax revenue. So education is defunded. We have a loss of market value for philanthropic contributions, so fundraising, which is a huge endeavor for the, for the university. Uh, there's a decrease in endowment returns, which is percentages and markets and things like that. Layoffs and furloughs of administrative staff. Changes in part-time non-tenure and non-tenure track faculty, as well as a decrease in faculty hires. So at every level, people are affected. And remember from last week, we talked about austerity measures of really cuts happening at the bottom, so affecting students, affecting um, faculty, in order for those at the top, the, the regents, the chancellors, those in the highest administrative positions, to keep benefits and their salaries intact. So what we see from 2008 is an increase in tuition, class sizes, and pressures on student services in order to offset all of these increased costs. And this little graph shows you that in 16 and 17, um, what a small percentage of, uh, of services towards students were from the, the uh, California government. And in fact, a bulk of that is coming from California or from the UC system itself and its internal kind of money matters. So then these last few slides are um, an article came out last week um, in the LA Times, which Thomas loves. And I appreciate all the articles he sends me from there. They talk so much about the UCs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, there's the um, pre UC President Janet Napolitano and some other people released some quotes about where the UC is right now and how, how we are in a crisis and what that means. Um, so I've underlined just a few interesting things um, that they're already looking at budget cuts. That in fact, like San Diego has already said, we need to decrease our budget by 4% across the board. Where they're getting that number, who knows? But it's preemptive budget cuts, uh, preemptive austerity measures in order to kind of hopefully um, cushion what's going to happen, even though no one knows. It, like, no one knows anything that's happening. Um, that without additional funding, students may face larger class sizes, reduced course offerings, more difficult getting into needed classes, and higher tuition, which is what we already saw happen after 2008. It's just the same story happening again. Right? The cuts are happening and are affecting students without really any changes to the top or how we have a, like how we understand our university system. And that while the UC is getting some government funding, um, President Napolitano says that this isn't going to even cover a month of extra costs. Now, what are these extra costs? Where is this money coming from? Um, these losses in revenue are from housing and dining contracts, facility cleaning costs, and transitioning to remote instruction. How they're figuring this much money out in like transitioning to remote instruction baffles me because I'm not really sure. I haven't seen any of that money. I don't know anyone else who's transitioned to online teaching has either. Um, that in a, the UC health system, $170 million is from cancellation of elective procedures. So you can just see in that small statistic, the amount of money that is in our health system that is just profits. It's not even services, right? This is like how they're thinking about money in our health system. And that last, while there is a huge demand for financial aid um, and fa family economic stability, it should all be covered. So again, students themselves, the UC has enough money to help with, but all of their profits, all the things that are going to affect the top, the administrators and their salaries and things like that are being affected and causing the UC to be in crisis. So it's not even about student services. It's really about profits and how the university is losing profits, losing the ability to um, acquire more wealth that, it's, that is in crisis in the UC today. It's also just for fun, um, the UC loves a good crisis to justify their hiring practices anyways. So like last week we talked about the 
asked me a protest against contract workers and one of Jan Napolitano's original sort of defenses of why they needed to keep having contract workers was in case of another fire like the ones we've seen and that we need them for that kind of emergency. So crisis, even when we're not experiencing one, which we are, but when we're not experiencing one, it still is a way that they can justify certain cuts, certain labor practices, certain structures that are not great. But that was like so much gloom, bloom, bloom, whatever. Um, disaster, as a matter of fact, does create opportunity in all kinds of ways, not just for the implementation of neoliberal agendas or conservative, conservative progressive agendas. It also opens up opportunity for progressive change that can benefit people and resistance movements that are willing to fight for a more just and equitable society. So there's just a couple of real perfunctory examples with the New Deal after um, the Great Depression is one example of a massive change that looks to give lots of people back into work and to create infrastructure and create sort of people-owned things. Uh, it was actually, Friedman was responding to this a lot in his own policies and his own sort of political positioning. He thought we had kind of really fucked up with the New Deal and he needed to correct for that. Uh, more recently, after the 2008 financial crisis, we saw the Occupy movement, which was advocating for a lot of things that seemed really radical at the time, but some of which have become kind of standard talking points in current, like even presidential um, debate topics. So it really has affected the way we affect and see our politics. Amidst COVID-19, we see uh, mutual aid networks really coming to the foreground. A lot of these existed before COVID-19, but have really taken on new prominence and a new central importance. And so there's this website, the Brick. Big Door Brigade, which outlines and kind of collects information about mutual aid networks throughout the U.S., how to get involved, how to contribute, and also sort of how to just get in touch with where mutual aid networks in your area are. There's also been labor organizing amongst undercompensated and underprotected essential workers, like we're seeing with Instacart, Amazon employees, whole food workers, kind of across the board. And so opportunity exists in terms of disaster, not just for neoliberal privatization schemes, but also for kind of progressive change. And to think about that in the next couple of weeks, so far we've talked about a lot of the structural problems and um, things that we're dealing with. Um, we wanna start talking about examples of direct action and how historically people have fought these kinds of conditions. So next week's topic is, do you wanna read it? Yeah, direct um, action gets the goods, labor organizing and history. Um, so yeah, we're going to be kind of transitioning into this idea of times of crises as positive and progressive change. And, and right, like to think about, this is happening in Strike University, the thing that comes out of the strike comes out of this moment where we're like in, at Zoom University. So it's really, I think, it can be moments of good change. And also on Thomas's point about, um, this has been showing us that the elites, those that are in charge of this financial global economy, are just concerned about their own power and deepening that, right? It is the people on the ground, the, the everyday person who is doing these radical changes involved in these mutual aid networks that are caring for people day to day. And I think that's really admirable and what we want to get into a little bit more. Okay, we're done, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>